Good morning and welcome to Union Center Church of the Brethren on a beautiful Sunday morning. Whether here or out in our YouTube and Facebook universe. Would you join us in our morning hymn, number 89, For the Beauty of the Earth. In the first letter of John, we are told, This is the message we have heard and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in God there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Jesus while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We are telling you these things so that our joy may be complete.
Would you join me in a responsive morning psalm? Psalm 133 is one of the shortest psalms in the Bible. It begins, Look at how good and pleasing it is when the family of God lives together as one. It is like expensive oil poured over the head, running down into the beard, Aaron's beard, which extended over the collar of his robes. That's what the Bible says anyway. Most of us wouldn't sit still while someone poured oil over their head and got it all over their clothes. So let's try something else. It is like coming home from vacation and discovering family members clean the whole house from top to bottom while we were gone. It's like watching the sunset on the longest day of the year, drinking iced tea and roasting marshmallows around a campfire with a breeze just strong enough to blow the mosquitoes away. It is like like learning the show you love that was canceled, was picked up by another network, and is coming back to life. It is like a warm fire and a good book indoors on a cold winter's day. And this next one comes right out of the Bible. It is like the dew on Mount Hermon, streaming down onto the mountains of Zion. Because it is there that the Lord has commanded the blessing, everlasting life. Yes, it is like that, like all of that, when families and the family of God live together as one.
Well, this is the uh, time that we have our children's story, and I'd like to invite my friends to come forward for the children's story at this time. Well, let's uh, fold our hands into our Bibles. This is the Bible. We'll open it wide. There are many stories of people inside. Big people, little people like me and you. We'll listen carefully to hear what they do. Well, today's story is called, When We Share, Everyone Has Enough. Now, the friends of Jesus came from different places. Some were rich and some were poor. Some owned businesses. Some worked hard for those who owned a business. Some had children. Some didn't. But they came together to worship God, sing songs, to remember Jesus, and talk about how someday Jesus will come again. They also came together to eat meals. They brought different kinds of food and put it on the same table, and then everyone would eat. The friends of Jesus learned to share with each other. They wanted to make sure that everybody had enough, no matter how much money they had or how many things they owned. We still try to make sure everyone has enough. We share food at church meals. We collect money so we can share food with other people, some who live close to us and some who live very far away. We are all the friends of Jesus, and we want to share like Jesus. And our Bible verse is, the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their friends. Now, we're going to be having the Lord's Prayer next, so you can help me with the Lord's Prayer, okay? All righty. Ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Here is your sheet. Thank you very much for coming up. Today, I will be reading from Acts chapter 4. The community of believers was one in heart and mind. None of them would say, this is mine, about any of their possessions, but held everything in common. The apostles continued to bear powerful witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And an abundance of grace was at work among them all. There were no needy persons among them. Those who owned properties or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds from the sales, and place them in the care and under the authority of the apostles. Then it was distributed to anyone who was in need. When you're a beginning piano student, you make a lot of mistakes. You know, you just do. But, uh, uh, and you do a lot of plinking at first, just getting the one note and following along uh, with, with what's on the page. I know as a lifelong beginning piano student, uh, 
but you yearn to go a little further as, as, as time goes by. And one of, the, one of the first happy experiences for beginning piano students is when they learn either the left-hand part or the right-hand part of heart and soul. You know what I'm talking about? You know, a little, little four-chord thing going here, and somebody starts going, dun, 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 dun. And uh, I remember very clearly finding one of the piano rooms at Laverne College back in 1972 in the old days, uh, and, and practicing, just, just making some noise, you know, getting that going. And then uh, one of the, the, the students, the other, another freshman, he was a Japanese student who didn't have much English yet, and he was an extremely accomplished musician. And uh, he just accepted that I was doing those chords, and he began to plunk out the right, you know, the right hand part of heart and soul. And what is wonderful is no matter at what level you're proficient, proficient you begin to make harmony. It is very simple harmony. Uh, it may not impress anybody, and if some accomplished piano player was to push you over and to use all ten fingers and their feet upon the pedals, it would sound magnificent, but that's not what matters. Harmony is happening, and it often happens between people of very disparate. Now, the song, Heart and Soul, was written by two people that couldn't get along together in normal life. Hoagie Carmichael, a Hoosier, wrote the uh, music. And Frank Lesser, who was nobody at that point, but would go on to write Guys and Dolls and How to Succeed in Business Without re Really Trying, and is famous for being one of the few people who chewed Frank Sinatra out during the production of a movie because he wasn't doing it right and somehow didn't get killed. Um, you know, uh, he, just, he just didn't get along with anybody. But they got along long enough to make this song for a movie, because in those days, if you belonged to a studio, you did what you were told. Um, I, I, there's words, as most people don't know, to the song. Heart and soul, I fell in love with you. Heart and soul, the way a fool would do madly, because you held me tight and stole a kiss in the night. Heart and soul, I begged to be adored, lost control, and tumbled overboard gladly. That magic night we kissed, there in the moon mist. And there's a little more. I don't know if I feel like singing it. I may sing some more of it later. But it, it kind of actually, the song illustrated some of what's going on in the scripture. Heart and soul. I was uh, working on this scripture about a year ago for an internet service, and although this translation said heart and mind, uh, in the Greek it says, and all the people that were believing were one in heart, in cardia, heart, you get the cardiac arrest thing there, cardia, and pasuke, or psyche, or sometimes translated mind, sometimes translated soul, but your person, that which is you, what you are at your most elemental level, your pasuke or your uh, psyche is your being. And, it, and for those believers in Jerusalem who probably spoke Greek and Aramaic and knew Hebrew as a church language, also knew that the Hebrew word nephesh, which means breath. You know, if you don't have breath, you're not a person. And breath, that word nephesh, was used also for who you were at your core. It had nothing to do with your height or with your width. It had nothing to do with what shape you were in or how much your knees hurt in the morning. It's who you are, essentially, as a being. And they were all together in heart and soul. Um, the, at that point in the early church, they did not have a complicated theology, as it points out in here. The apostles were proclaiming the resurrected Christ. Jesus is risen. There wasn't a whole lot more than that yet. They weren't worrying about exactly what it meant to talk about a divine being who was fully human. They weren't getting embroiled in some of the theological disputes, uh, which would lead, uh, in the case 
of uh, the early Roman Empire four centuries later in literally thousands of people being killed by other Christians simply because they didn't agree exactly on certain technical points. There was no Spanish Inquisition yet, and there weren't people on TV and social media telling us who are Christians and who aren't because of this or that or the other. They were just starting out and discovering, despite the fact that there was rich and that they were poor, and that these Christians who were believers who had come for the Passover, these first Christians, from across the Roman Empire, because they wanted to celebrate it in Jerusalem, were there for the Pentecost, the Passover, and the Feast of Weeks, and just continued to stay there and enjoy each other's company, weren't worried about all the other things that would later perhaps tear them apart. Dissensions lay in the future. Persecution from outsiders lay in the future. But right now, they were simply gathering together and eating. It was like they were having the Union Center fish dinner one day and the chicken and noodle supper the next day. There was always something to eat. It involved a community effort, and it was great joy to be together, heart and soul. That heart and soul also called to mind the essential confession of faith from Deuteronomy, where it says in the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. With your whole being, you shall belong to God. <laughs> well, it reminded me of the song because, of course, the song says they fell in love forever just because of one chance kiss. And, you know, sometimes that's all it takes. You know, falling in love means a glance or a moment, uh, and then a lifelong, uh, a lifelong relationship. And it's not simply meeting somebody and getting married. It can be how we're attracted to a subject to, uh, to a certain type of flower, to a hobby, to whatever it is that attracts us. And it's also the same with the church. Most of us do not join the church because we have a complicated theology and we're looking for somebody that matches it exactly. We're simply welcomed. We find people who are glad to see us the second time we're there. We're not necessarily having to check at the door if we belong to the same political party, root for the same team, or go to the same grocery store. That may come later. That may come from the people that want to complicate things or think that they are the gatekeeper. But at the beginning, there is simply the welcome, the feeling that you belong finally, and that where you belong is in the presence of Jesus Christ. Heart and soul is something that begins momentarily and will progress, but it also allows us room to change a little bit. You know, the early brethren were one with their first baptism in 1708, and others were glad to join them as well throughout Europe as they began to spread. But then they uh, began to experience hardship, persecution, and ultimately an internal struggle over the early question in Europe of whether uh, you could marry somebody outside the faith. And in 1719, scarcely 11 years later, they had a crisis because somebody, brethren, married somebody from a Mennonite congregation. Oh, heaven forbid. Most people are colorblind at that range, to be honest, but you know they knew the difference. And so half of the brethren migrated to America in 1719, and the other half in 1729. And by the time they came back together again, nobody cared about what had split them apart. There were other lessons to be learned. Early on in America, the brethren decided that uh, in order to be properly Christian, they needed to look at the and take it literally, that they would put all their money into the center of the table and share it that way. But uh, after trying that out, they discovered it didn't work as well as they thought because they didn't know how to administer it well. 
and they began to simply care for each other all the time to make sure there was nobody in want or in need, to know each other well enough and to love each other well enough that they were aware of who needed what at a certain time. And indeed, we do that as a congregation and as a community, and uh, we do that in partnership with other congregations, with our friends at the center as well, because it's not something that any one of us can do by ourselves, and there's many other ways in which we do this. But we grow. Uh, we learn that not one of us can be the whole church by ourselves, and that means none of us has to be the gatekeeper. We simply have to strive at its core to be one in heart and soul. Sometimes it's easy to want to make it even more complicated. But the apostles originally declared Jesus is risen and that our beliefs and our lifestyle and our relationship with each other stems from that. We are one in belief and practice, but the practice and the belief are centered upon our love and our care for each other. It means that, uh, in a way, our life is like that song. We begin to plunk out on the piano, the basic notes, searching for the harmony, learning from each other, and our song begins to grow more complex as time goes by. But it also becomes second nature, so that sitting down at the keyboard or looking at our checkbook and figuring out what goes where, including who we can serve and how we can bless others, becomes second nature because we began by pouring our heart and soul into it until our love becomes such an essential part of us, our love for Jesus and our love for each other, that it is the most natural and normal thing in the world. I may not have progressed very far on the piano in all the decades since 1972, trust me, a few of you heard me play, but I feel like with your encouragement and your blessing that I certainly have learned more about what it means to be a faithful follower of Christ, not by myself, but with all of us together. And thank you very much. Amen. Our sermon hymn is number 544. Take your time coming on up, because you never know when I'm going to end. When we walk with the Lord.
This week's prayer focus is for those like me who are hard of hearing. Matter of fact, while I was preaching, I heard the little noise that goes with first one battery going dead and then the other. So you're welcome to say whatever you want to me about the sermon. I won't hear you. <laughs> but please pray this week for those of us who, despite our hearing aids, struggle to hear as well as for our families who put up with the fact that we simply do not hear very well, even with hearing aids. I was trying to remember what I said about this uh, topic last year when we, when we also shared as our prayer focus the heart of hearing. I probably called to mind Garrett Morris, one of the original cast members of Saturday Night Live, who would provide shouting that underscored the reading of the news for the featured weekend uh, update. It was a parody of local stations who at that point were just beginning to use sign language for the top story of the evening. Um, this was before the day when everything was closed captioned. And Garrett Morris, while somebody would read the final story, um, the, the top story, like Chevy Chase would say, our top story tonight is Generalissimo Francisco Franklin is still dead. And trust me, that was funny 47 years ago. <laughs> And Garrett Morris would say, our top story tonight, you know, in a little bubble towards the corner, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would have also mentioned last year that you don't have to shout to be heard by someone like me. Just talk clearly and in a consistently lower pitch. It really helps. And please, most of all, have patience with us. We're hard of hearing, but we really care about what you're saying because it's important. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Our offering statement. What do you say the day that scripture comes from Acts 4 and we're reminded that believers sold land and other possessions and laid them at the feet of the apostles that no one in the fellowship should go hungry? Squirm a little from the guilt or resolve that we're all growing in discipleship and will continue to seek ways we can help the less fortunate. Maybe the second option, and while we're at it, let's celebrate the many ways we impact this church, the community, and the world through our giving and sharing. Let us pray. Christ who gave all, bless us in our giving today that we may continue to see all humanity as our family and seek to bless all and serve all through our offerings in discipleship to your world. Amen. As the team comes up, I'd like to suggest that today, as we sing our benediction song, that you remain seated and take in the words of this song, which speak of ways in which we can live out the scriptures that we listen to today. For us, that can seem really strange to think that we could actually live like that, and it would be great. Uh, it's actually Jesus' call and God's call to us, and this song speaks introspectively of what we can do to achieve that. Don't get it right. 
Would you rise and join me in our responsive benediction? The risen Jesus said to Thomas, Have you believed because you have seen me? Jesus said to us, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. And with Thomas we say, My, my Lord and